This time on Psychic Investigators, a woman fails to show up for work. Don't break police department. My wife is missing. Her husband says she's left him, but her family doesn't buy it. We knew something terrible was wrong. Then a psychic sees something terrifying. She's not missing. She's dead. Will the police take her vision seriously? Some people believe it. Some people don't. Can the psychic help the police solve the mystery of what happened to Jennifer McCrady? Along the Ohio River, reminders of the booming coal industry float by the town of Belpre, Ohio. It's a quiet working class town. Families have lived here for generations. An unlikely place for the drama about to unfold with a phone call to the local police Thursday afternoon, September 19th, 1996. Belpre Police Department. Hi, this is Trevor McCready. Uh-huh. My wife is missing. I'll have an officer come in and give you a call up there and talk to you. Okay. The call comes from Ohio State Trooper Jack McCrady from his post in Marietta. Trooper McCrady and his wife Jennifer, a nurse, are well known around Belpre. A seemingly happy family, they have two small children and are very close to Jennifer's parents. The greatest thing for Jenny was being a mom. She just dearly loved those two boys. Jack McCrady is a respected state trooper with five years service. He was named the county's trooper of the year. He's also a familiar face at the Belpre Police Department. State troopers often use the office when they make arrests in the area. When I worked at the police station, the state highway patrol would normally bring people in there. So I got to know Jack from coming in there with people that he's arrested or doing an accident report, they would come there and use our office. The city of Belpre is very small, six or 7,000 people, and 11-man department. He knows everybody that works there. He was born and raised in the area. Detective Sergeant Dave Garvey is assigned to the case. At first, the detective treats McCrady's call about his wife as routine. Husbands and wives have problems. If any police department actively pursued every missing husband and or wife in the first three or four hours, Bobby wouldn't get much work done. Three hours later, when Trooper McCrady returns home, he calls the Belpre police again. He confirms Detective Garvey's initial thoughts. She is apparently not missing. OK. Uh, she's cleaned out pretty much everything, what she owns. OK. Wedding rings were laying on the kitchen counter. Apparently, she's all right. <laughs> but is she? When Jennifer's parents hear the news, they're shocked. Unlike the police, they refuse to believe Jack's story. And he says, she packed her clothes and, and took $3,000 and, and, and left. Jenny would not leave on her own and not tell us that she was going someplace. We knew something terrible was wrong. Twelve hours later, Belpre police find Jennifer's red blazer abandoned in the park along the Ohio River. There's no sign of the 31-year-old mother. But a detailed search turns up nothing. No blood, no purse, no sign of a struggle. It's a mystery. It's as if Jennifer McCrady just vanished into thin air. Garvey zeroes in on her husband. All Jack was saying was that he came home from work, She's gone. I think she's with somebody else. Garvey talks to her family, her friends, checks her bank accounts, her phone records. Nothing turns up. Jack's story about her secret lover looks shaky. Co-workers did not believe that she was seeing anybody or had ever seen anybody at all. Her mom and dad just were emphatic that she would never, ever leave. Her best friends said, she would never leave the boys. Jennifer was a very sweet, heartfelt girl. Everybody liked Jennifer. 
my first thoughts were, well, maybe had she been in an accident, something had happened, because it just wouldn't be her just not to show up or not contact her family. My thoughts were probably the same as everyone else's. Something just didn't sound right. But what? Five days after Jennifer McCready disappeared, the entire town is concerned, but police have no real leads. We waited and waited, and we just wondered whether we were even going to, you know, if they were ever going to be able to find her. As the pressure mounts, dispatcher Moni Tanner, who took the first call from Jack McCready, makes an unusual suggestion. She remembers Washington County had used a psychic from Pittsburgh to help on one of their cases a few years earlier. Well, I figured we didn't have any leads, so what could it hurt to try? If she could help with the case and give us something to go on, we, were, we weren't going anywhere as it was. The detective did not want anything to do with it, but he said if I wanted to call, to go ahead and do it. Everyone's looking to me to do something, make something happen. I have no leads. You end up sitting at the desk, and you really don't know what you're going to do next. I want to use the training that I've been giving to solve a crime. I didn't want to be embarrassed by looking at someone and says, well, I'm going to call a psychic. I just didn't want to be laughed at. Georgia Rudolph, a psychic who was living in Pittsburgh, has been helping the police with cases for 20 years. It is a phone call that will change everything. One of the first things she said to me was, we have a missing person. And I said, I'm going to tell you, she's not missing. She's dead. There's more to the human being than what you see. It's mind, body, spirit. Everybody has their own vibrational pattern. There have been cases where I have felt like I was almost a part of the situation. There have been other cases where I have felt that the deceased, it's never happened with a missing person because they're not going to get into my mind. Um, the deceased has practically entered my mind or is standing right there. And they, they feed me the information. Or I feel like I'm experiencing what that person experienced at the end of their life. One of the ways I know if a person has passed is by the intensity of the vibration that I'm getting. If it's a low, more intent vibration, then they're still very much alive and on the earth. If it's a high-pitched vibration, then they've passed. This lady was dead. When I learned the information, it creeped me out. And Moni came back and said, you need to talk with Georgia. And the first day, I said, no, I don't. Some people believe it, some people don't. So for probably maybe a day, I didn't call her. Five days after Jennifer McCready disappeared, Detective Garvey still has nothing. So against his better instincts, he calls the psychic. In the conversation I had with Georgia on the phone, she said Jennifer was dead. He said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And he said, what happened to her? She was shot in the back of the head once. Then he asked me, do you know who did this? And I said, yes. The man you are looking for would remind you of a lumberjack. His physique, not his face. He said, do you know what he does for a living? And I said, like a cop. The detective's mind is racing. Could the psychic be talking about Jack McCready? At 6'2 and 200 pounds, the cop is built like a lumberjack. But if Jennifer McCready is dead, where is she? I told them I don't know where she is, but I can tell you how to get there. I said, 
said, you want to get on the main road going outside of your town. And you stay on that road, and you go south, and you're going to come to a town. It wasn't clear, but you're going to see a road. And the numbers to it are two, nine, eight. And you're going to see a dirt gravel road that goes up. And you walk up that road, and you're going to find the body of Jennifer McCrady. A psychic with no prior knowledge of the case has just told the detective that a heavily built cop killed Jennifer McCrady with a bullet to the head. She's also given him mysterious clues about where to find the body. Could the respected state trooper really have killed his wife? The word of a psychic is not enough for the detective. South of town, 298. Had to look up. I really didn't know what that meant. Then, 24 hours later, there's a call to the Belpre police station that will blow the investigation wide open. The following Monday, after I talked with Georgia on the phone, a local citizen came to the office. They told me that they were south of town. They saw a state highway patrol car coming down a hill on Township 298. And she said, the look he gave me, you just need to look into that. And I knew the area that she was talking about, Torch, was south of town, near Township 298. Could this be the trail the psychic described? The similarities are so strong that Garvey, still skeptical, decides to check it out. He drives south of Belpre on the road leading to Torch, Ohio. At Township Road 298, he finds an abandoned oil field road. This is the road where the caller had seen the trooper's car. And unable to access the old field road, you have to go up a hill. So if you actually went ahead and sat on 298 and looked up the old field road, you're looking up a hill. I walked the road back probably 150 to 175 yards. I noticed what looked like to me a fresh grave. It was an area in size about four feet wide, three or four feet long. It was freshly dug, but it was very shallow. I thought about the possibilities. I went and I called Jeff Sievers. Jeff Sievers is a detective at the Washington County Sheriff's Office. The road is in his jurisdiction. His first question? Why is a trooper on a dirt road? Troopers don't go off pavement, is our, our saying. The troopers stay on, on the pavement because they don't want to get their cars dirty. So when I heard that information, that sent an immediate red flag up to me. As both men head to what looks like a gravesite, Garvey tells Seavers about the psychic's eerie visions. I can recall talking with Jeff about what Georgia had said. And we both joked about it. Jeff took his fingers and just dug into the dirt. And he came up with a blue nylon slick surface. And we moved a little bit more dirt away, and we found a zipper. Local farmers do not put cows, pigs, hogs, or dead animals in a zippered bag. The zippered bag is, in fact, a sleeping bag. Fearing the worst, Seavers immediately cordons off the area and calls in the crime scene unit. We dug into the point where we got to the sleeping bag, and then we slowly excavated around it until we you know, could uh, unzip the sleeping bag and see that there was a human body. We uncovered and unzipped the bag. A white plastic bag had been placed over her head. We removed it. It was the body of Jennifer McCrady. 
A missing persons case is now a homicide. The question is, how did Jennifer die? She had a gunshot wound to her head. It looked like it was a single shot to the right side of her head, just above her right ear. And it didn't look like there was an exit wound at that time. She was wearing a pink pajama bottom and her sleeping shirt. And her feet were bare. And the bottom of her feet were clean. Common sense would say that she was shot at her house. From the location of the body to the way she was killed, it seems the psychic was correct. I never doubted it. Jennifer McCrady wanted to be found. The doorbell rang about 2.30 in the morning, October 2nd. And it was the sheriff and the police, and they said, we found her. It was a closure. The least know, because sometimes people don't even get that. At the highway patrol post in Marietta, Garvey delivers the bad news to Jennifer's husband. Jack broke down, dropped his head, covered his eyes, and he sobbed and he cried. And I left the room for about five seconds, and I got him some towels to wipe his eyes. And I handed them to him, and he wiped his face, and he handed them back to me, and I looked at him. They were bone dry. Something else disturbing. McCready never asks where his wife was found or how she was killed. Is he the cop the psychic said committed the crime? The detective now believes he is. We talked to him and told him that he needed to tell us what had happened, and Jack just wouldn't say anything at all. And finally, he said he'd like to talk to a lawyer. Jack McCready is relieved of duty. The grieving husband is now the prime suspect. We were investigating one of our own now for a murder, and it was really upsetting that it was not only his wife, but a mother of two small children. He has some training. He knows how interviews work. He knows how tricks work when you talk to people. So you have to treat him differently. Armed with a search warrant, investigators search the McCready home and discover crucial evidence. Hidden in the ceiling rafters of the garage, they find all of Jennifer's personal belongings. We also found a gun. That was a 357 Magnum gun, which could have been the caliber that was used to kill her. And somehow, someone had tampered with the barrel of the gun so that we couldn't match the bullet that was found in her head to that gun. Also, out in a shed outside of the residence, we found a shovel. The dirt on it came back with the same consistency of the dirt found at the gravesite. We never found a crime scene or a place where she was shot. But the evidence that we found in the house was very crucial. Three days after finding Jennifer's body, police charged Jack McCready with murdering his wife. He pleads innocent. 18 months later, on October 20th, the trial begins. The prosecution of Jack McCready was a circumstantial evidence case. There was no confession from Mr. McCready. There was no eyewitness who was able to take the stand and describe for the jury how he or she saw the crime being committed. The case generated a, a very high level of attention in, in the community. First of all, again, the nature of the crime, the, the tragedy of a, of a young mother being killed and the two children being without their mother, added to that the fact that the defendant was a law enforcement officer. And I think by and large in this community, law enforcement officers still have uh, a fair amount of respect of the people. And this really was shook that uh, belief. Yet the discovery of Jennifer's body allows the prosecution to argue that Jack has lied about his wife's disappearance from day one. When the body was located, she was wearing the kind of things she would have worn to bed. It's not something that a woman would wear when she was running off for a rendezvous with a secret lover. That was obviously a crucial uh, piece of evidence. The trial also revealed that Jack lied about his marriage. A co-worker testified Jennifer had told her that she was planning to leave Jack and take the kids. 
The prosecution argued that on the night of September 19th, Jennifer and Jack fought over her decision. Jack wasn't going to let that happen. He took his gun, and while his kids slept in their room, he shot his wife in the back of the head. To catch any blood loss, he put a white plastic bag over her head. To move the body, he stuffed her inside a blue sleeping bag. Using her red blazer, he drove to the abandoned oil field road outside of town. His plan, they argued, was to bury her there temporarily. Later, he would return and move the body to a place where it would never be found. To create a false trail, he ditched the car at the Belpre Park and returned home to his two sleeping boys. The jury in Marietta, Ohio, deliberated for 14 hours before reaching its verdict. Guilty. Psychic Georgia Rudolph's amazing visions helped to put a cold-blooded killer behind bars. Georgia's information made a world of difference. It solved the case. Without that information and the resultant discovery of Jen's body, uh, I don't think there would have even been a charge filed against Mr. McCready. It would have been simply an unsolved missing persons case. Following Georgia's guidelines or thoughts, whatever you want to say, led us to finding Jennifer. We found Jennifer, we found the bad guy, he goes to jail, and the family feels better. A psychic's insight not only helped to solve this case, but helped to change some skeptics into believers. People did not want to believe that Georgia could do it or a psychic could do it, but after it was over with, there was different feelings. Not only did she say where the body would be discovered, she said she was dead before anyone else had reached that conclusion. And, I, and then she also said, and she described who had killed her, and then she said, and you might not want to hear this, but the person who killed her was a cop. Uh, and so all of those bits of information, uh, I think, were uh, remarkable. Now, looking back, it, it all, yeah, well, sure, everybody knows that. But when she made those statements, that was not something that most people believed. There is some, some ironic coincidences there. When you talk about the name early in the investigation, that the man that killed Jennifer was a very strong, well-built man. And she actually used the name of a lumberjack. And ironically, Jack's name is Jack. How Georgia Rudolph acquired the information, I have no idea. It, it is, uh, I, I simply can't explain how she was able to provide that information, but thank goodness that she did. From the beginning, Georgia never questioned her insights. For her, it was always about helping people. I got a wonderful letter from the prosecuting attorney. He made it very clear to me that the people of Washington County owed me a debt of gratitude. For Jennifer's mother, finding her daughter's killer is what she hoped for. But it can't heal the heartbreak of losing a child. If it hadn't been for Georgia, we'd have never have gotten Jenny back. I don't know how they do it. It's just a special uh, blessing, I guess, that they've got that they can do it. She is my very best friend. I, I, I talked to her. I still talk to her. People think I'm crazy, but nobody knows I'm talking to her. She can hear me. Sure.